G'day and welcome back to the Ranty Chair. Now, there's go-karts next door today. We've got a lot of weather going on, but they're still running go-karts, so hopefully the noise of the go-karts won't overwhelm my feeble, aged voice as I make this video. But anyway, on with the video. Why am I making a video today? I just did a rant just a couple of days ago. Well, this is a bit of a news update. There has been a report that a drone has collided with a helicopter in Switzerland. Now, I've only seen one report. I'll link to it in the description of this video, so go and read that. But it seems that a helicopter and a drone collided um, somewhere in some hill country, and uh, it has been reported. Now, this is very interesting, very important, because when a helicopter collided with a, a, a drone over New York Harbour last year, sometime I think it was, um, I said, and other people said, well, look, the helicopter survived. There were no injuries. The helicopter landed safely. And other people came out and said, but it was a military helicopter. It was hardened to this sort of thing and not your average civilian helicopter. So we still must be very careful that drones will bring down helicopters. Uh, this helicopter in the Swiss incident was just a normal commercial helicopter from what I gather. It's very hard to get a lot of detail because there's only one report. So it kind of says that, well, even normal commercial helicopters are not going to be brought down necessarily by colliding with the drone because here we have another incident, incident where this has happened. When the helicopter landed apparently there was damage seen on the rotor blades but it's interesting they said it wasn't a bird because there was no blood. Now I find that interesting because would you expect to, is this drone done the same amount of damage as a bird might do? If they were concerned that it might have been bird causing the damage then obviously Birds are as much of a risk as drones, and there's a hell of a lot more birds out there, and you don't get flocks of drones in the same way you get flocks of birds. So, um, obviously, there is a, a risk, a very, very small risk of a drone and a helicopter colliding when people are being stupid and flying drones in the wrong place and without necessary care and attention. But even if there is a collision, it does not mean people are necessarily going to die. We've proven that on two occasions now. Two evidenced occasions when we've had drones and helicopters colliding, nobody's been injured, nobody's died. Okay, you wouldn't want to be the owner of the helicopters because it's a huge expense, but even with a small piece of damage to those rotors, you can't go flying around with damaged rotors. But people's lives were not lost, and that's the key thing. Now, I'm the first one to say right now that whoever was flying that drone needs a kick up the ass. Why were you flying a drone in an area where there could be a helicopter? Assumingly, they were flying beyond visual line of sight, or they would have seen the helicopter and stayed well clear of it. So what the hell were you doing? Um, I'm not going to say beyond visual line of sight is always dangerous, in the same way that I'm not going to say that a drone colliding with a helicopter will produce fatalities. People do fly beyond visual line of sight. We know that. Go on YouTube. You will find hundreds, if not thousands, of videos of people flying a long way away. I saw one this morning, a guy flying seven kilometres from his launch point. Um, it was in the UK, I think. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. Uh, he did it all exactly right. He shows how you can do this properly. And he landed when he heard a helicopter flying in the area. Ah, rocket science, it is not. This is simple stuff. I've done the same thing myself when I've been flying within visual line of sight. Land, landed when a helicopter could be heard because you don't know what the helicopter's gonna do. They're supposed to fly above 500 feet, but you can't guarantee that because Pilots of full-size aircraft are just as inclined, if not more so, to break the rules as pilots of drones. So we have to take the initiative, the high ground, and make sure that we're doing things properly because you can't rely on every pilot to do things properly. So there you go. This guy landed short of his launch point because he heard a helicopter. Great, fantastic. Now that's good stuff. I mean, that was safe beyond visual line of sight flying, and apparently this guy does quite a bit of it, so he knows what he's doing. And most of the people who do fly beyond visual line of sight regularly know exactly what they're doing. They take great care to remain low or fly in areas where there's no full-size aircraft and keep an ear out because as we know, I know here, I'm sitting in my workshop and I can hear aircraft through the walls of the hangar before they call up at the five mile point. They'll call up five miles out saying they're on approach to the airport. I can hear them before I hear the radio call. That's why your ears work. I'm old, my ears are pretty bugger, but I can still hear an aircraft, you know, long before I can see it. So if you're flying BVLOS and you're staying within, you know, three or five miles, you should be able to hear any aircraft that is in the vicinity and act accordingly. This guy did. Great, great stuff. The guy flying the drone that hit the Swiss helicopter, not so good. Now, these are the people who give us a bad name. Now, <laughs> the, the liquid sunshine is falling with, with, with great gusto at the moment, so hopefully it's not going to make too much hissing on the audio track. But I thought, I, wanted, I thought I'd bring this to your attention because obviously, all the doomsayers are going to be out and go, oh, look, look, people could have died. And we can turn around and say, no, they didn't. And this brings me to another thing, something I'd really like to see happen. I want to see someone fly a phantom into a tail rotor. 
Now, no, no, don't get me wrong, not on a helicopter that's flying, but there must be a lot of helicopters out there or tail rotor assemblies that have gone past time. Now, in the aviation world, things are often replaced as a matter of time. When they have reached so many hours of operational use, they are retired because we know that there's a, there's a, a curve that, um, an inverted bell curve, which means initially there's a high poten potential for failure rate. I'll go this way because it's on the video. Initially there's a high potential for failure rate because things are new and there could be cracks or stuff you don't know about. And then after it's been in service for a while, the probability of failure drops right down and it remains pretty constant for a long time. Then it starts to go up again as things age because again, cracks can start to form and propagate and material weakens and so forth over time. So generally in aviation, things are retired at a certain age. So there must be a lot of helicopter tail rotor assemblies and blades and gearboxes and so forth that have been aged out of service. So why don't we have someone grabbing this stuff, setting up a test jig, spinning the tail rotors up to their operational speed and flying a Phantom into it? What would be the cost? Obviously this stuff is only scrap value once it's been aged out of use. So, you know, a, few th a couple of thousand dollars, that's all it would take. A couple of thousand dollars to set something up so we could prove once and for all, whether flying a Phantom into the tail rotor of your average light commercial helicopter would cause catastrophic failure. So why don't we do that? And this is the question I always ask. Why hasn't someone done that? Well, I'm interested in the facts, not the speculation, not the what ifs, not the maybes, not the ooh, could be. I want the facts. And I'd be happy to do that. If I had the, 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 the money to buy this stuff, I would set up a test rig and I'd do it because I want to know. I want to know if it's going to cause catastrophic failure, which would potentially produce a much higher risk of someone being hurt or killed. So you would think that the people who are claiming this is going to kill you would be out there getting this rig set up and doing it themselves so they could prove to us that if a drone hits a helicopter tail rotor, then it's all over. Come on, surely that would prove it and we would have nowhere to stand. You can't argue with the facts, right? Now, the fact that these people spend so much time, effort and money preaching how dangerous drones are, but they don't go and collect the facts. They don't do some simple tests that would produce irrefutable evidence, means I don't think that they believe exactly what they're saying. I think, doesn't that rain? <laughs> I think they would rather remain uh, unsure. They'd rather have this fear, uncertainty and doubt in the picture than irrefutable facts, because the facts may not support their argument. And that's a worry. When you have people in positions of power and authority refusing to research and get the facts it means that they're pursuing an agenda which is not fact-based and that's not good enough we can't rules regulations everything have to be based on facts and science not on voodoo magic and bones and feathers you know you can't do that no hang on i'll just i'll cut for a while till the rain stops has abated somewhat. I will continue. So yeah, uh, if I could get my hands on a tail rotor assembly, a timed out tail rotor assembly, I, I would fly a drone into it and I'd record it all with high speed cameras and would look and see what damage was done. Now, obviously damage would be done. The drone would be obliterated. The tail rotor assembly probably would be damaged in some way, shape or form, but we need to quantify this so that we can come up with some realistic estimations of the risks associated with this. In the meantime, of course, I've got to say, don't be a dickhead and fly your drone recklessly or in the wrong place. We need to prove by our actions that we're a responsible group, a community of, of, of drone operators, model flyers. We need to make sure that there can never be a challenge to our responsibility because that puts us in a bad place. So yeah, we need to police others. If I had seen someone flying a drone like that, that would, oh, it comes the rain again. If I had seen a, someone flying a drone in a reckless, irresponsible way, I'd go and kick their ass. I really would. I would have words with them and they wouldn't be pleasant words either because that person is risking everybody's rights by doing that. So we need to, you need to do the same thing. You have to be very forthright if you see someone flying a drone in a, or a model aircraft in a dangerous fashion. You have to do it because otherwise we lose all the rights that we've had for so many years and we've worked so hard to protect. That's important. Now, Sunday here and next week, the weather is going to be fine, they tell us. Although you can't believe the forecast, honestly. <laughs> at this time of the year, at every time of the year, the forecast just it's, it's a rough guide to what might happen. It's a, you know, there's a, it's not guaranteed. Anyway, but it's supposed to be fine. By Thursday, we have light wind. So the balloon project will be full steam ahead. I will have the balloon project ready to go for Thursday. We'll get it aloft and away we go. Now, one important thing that I'm working on as well is 
a vehicle based ground station. Now you saw my video where I flew from the truck and that worked pretty well, but I would like to be able to fly a little bit further away from within the truck and also be able to move the truck around, especially with something like the balloon project. Can I follow the balloon in the truck and keep the DVR footage going? Let's see how we do that. that, that maybe that'll work. So I'm going to build a vehicle based ground station, which will have 5.8 gigahertz video receiver with a directional antenna and an omni antenna. It will have a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter antenna. Now this is interesting, a lot of stuff to talk about, separate video on this, but just to give you a heads up, um, you might think we'll just run some leads to the antennas, just make longer leads between the antenna and the receiver for the video and longer lead between the transmitter and the antenna for the radio control link, but it's not that easy, it really isn't, because the cable, at high frequencies like 2.4 and, and 5.8 gigahertz, the cables are, are, create a lot of loss. You, know, you, you get a lot of signal, just disappears because cables are not 100% efficient. So the longer your cable, then the more signal you lose. More importantly, as, as the frequency goes up, this becomes more of an issue. So if you ran a two or three meter cable from your goggles, the antenna connector on your goggles to an aerial on the roof of your vehicle, your results are not going to be stunning because you're going to lose some signal along that cable length and that is you know it might, and that signal can't be recovered by the receiver because it, it's before anything happens to it before it gets amplified and, and dealt with so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a diversity receiver on the roof of the vehicle which has short leads to the antennas so there's no losses and the cables are minimized and then I'll run an AV lead down to my goggles plug it into my goggles that will give me the best results I'm going to put the stuff on a pole as well. No use having it stuck straight on the roof of the truck because that's going to I mean it's going to be relatively low. It's only going to be a meter or meter and a half so above the ground, two meters above the ground. The higher you go up with your antennas, the better your range. So by putting that on a pole, which I can quickly elevate and, and drop, then I will be able to get much more range out of my FPV and my RC link. Now as I say, the other thing is with the transmitter link, this is going to take a bit of figuring out. I'm going to have to do some thinking about this because I can just run a lead from my transmitter to an antenna on the roof. But I, again, I'm going to get some loss. And I'm thinking, well, why not use a Wi-Fi booster? And I know people have done this before. You can run your transmitter into a Wi-Fi booster. So you can run the losses that you get in the cable between your transmitter and the, and the booster are more than compensated by the extra power that comes out of the booster. Now, the legality of this becomes an issue. Um, I'll have to check the ISM regulations for 2.4 gigahertz. How much can we run? Because some of those boosters are like two watts or more. And the other big, big issue is swamping. Now, swamping is very much an issue. You might have noticed this if you've got free sky with telemetry. You get your receiver and your transmitter too close together and it says telemetry lost. What the hell's going on there? It's only that far away. How can you lose a telemetry over, you know, a foot? Well, what happens is that the signal is so strong that the receiver or in either end, either the, either the telemetry receiver and the transmitter or the receiver on the other side can't cope with the intense signal strength. This is noticeable with the L9R. If you've got an L9R receiver and you've got, like I do, I've got a wing and got an L9R in it and as I bring the wing back to throw it while holding my transmitter, the receiver goes into failsafe, which is kind of, hmm, suddenly you, you, you can't throw a plane when it's in failsafe. So I have to hold my transmitter way out the side to launch my wing because otherwise I get them too close and it just failsafes because it overloads the receiver because it's a very sensitive receiver in the L9R. So there are a lot of factors here. So if I put a 2 watt booster on my transmitter, when I come into land near the truck, chances are my receiver will be swamped and the, the plane or the quad will crash because it'll go into failsafe. A lot of things to consider. So I'm going to have a good old think about that, do a video this week. Hopefully I'll get that ground station installed on the truck before I let the balloon go because we might, once we, the balloon starts to get out of range, I might just drive after it and just follow it for as long as I can and record the DVR footage. That could be interesting. So there you go. If you've got any comments, any ideas, any thoughts on what should go into a vehicle-based ground station, then let me know. I will have an LCD screen as well, of course, in case something happens with my goggles, I've got a, a backup, I can look at the screen and see what's going on. And so there's all sorts of issues like that. Um, it's going to be an interesting little project and I'll only spend a couple of days on it because I've only got a few days this week before I let the balloon go. And yeah, it's something other people, obviously, based on the feedback from my video of the truck, a lot of people are interested in vehicle-based FPV ground stations. So let's make one and see how it goes and try things out. Um, I'll use a helical for the, FP, for, the, um, for the FPV. I may actually use my, I've got a four-way helical control, a four-way diversity controller that I've built here. I might use that with four receivers and basically have a, a full uh, 180 degree coverage with the helicals out the front and then an omni for the flying around the back. That would be quite good. Should I make the um, antennas turnable? 
don't need tracking, it's all too complicated, and the vibration of moving, you know, when you're not using it would probably damage the tracker, so not really going to do that. But there's a lot of options, a lot of exciting stuff we can do with that, maybe make it as a project on RC Model Reviews, so everyone can build one. Who knows, I'll do some PDFs of the uh, templates for everything, and you can just cut stuff up and make it yourself, and solder stuff, if you know how to solder. There's a video on RC Model Reviews, we'll tell you that too. Right, that's it, rambled on enough. Helicopters and drones, not a good mix, uh, but not necessarily the dangerous cocktail that we have been led to believe. Comments, thoughts in the usual place, please. Thumbs up if you like the video, thumbs down if you don't. Stay tuned this week, it's going to be very busy. Lots of stuff coming for you. Bye for now.